lock out and remove all sources. Steam has all the hazards of a compressed gas with the added hazards of sometimes very extreme heats. It can be several hundred degrees, not just boiling point of water, but several hundred degrees past the boiling point, which causes instantaneous cooking of your body if you're exposed to it. It's not something you want to be exposed to. If you walked through that steam cloud, even if you had thick clothing on, what could happen? You could walk out in two pieces. It's not just burning hazard either. Steam carries the added energy of the mass of the water. And with that, it can be as sharp as a knife with the amount of energy. We did work at a hospital, and they told us the way they checked for steam leaks. They took a broomstick, and they would rush it through that cloud right there, up with the steam leaks in the rafters. And when they see the broomstick fall in two pieces, they knew they found their leak. <laughs> not something you'd want to walk through, right? <laughs> Cause severe laceration if you're lucky. might cut off parts of your body and cauterize at the same time. So safely working around steam, lock it out using double block and bleed. What is that? Double block and bleed. Just write it out here. You got steam coming into a system. Main steam valve right here. Maybe this is your system. Is locking out this steam valve enough? How many people know of leaky steam valves? Yeah, steam valves are notorious for leaking because it's kind of it's a highly uh, corrosive substance to be or erosive substance to be flowing through. So subsequently, with steam, when you're working around it, you want to use double block and bleed. There should be another valve here, and there should be a bleeder valve open, so that this should go all the way down to a drain, and then out. So you want to make sure you're open here, close here and close here when the steam's coming in. That way, if this valve leaks and there's pressure build up here, it'll escape through here and not pressure build up and then leak through that valve. And this protects you. This could be a boiler. Could just be another valve that you're servicing. But the only way to, to prevent uh, leak through with steam and ensure it stays that way is double block and bleed. Use pressure gauges just like with air. Make sure pressure's blood off and make sure it's uh, a thermal energy that's acceptable to work around. Yeah? Is there a cutoff of low pressure steam? Cutoff limit where you can work around yeah, it? Yeah, where you consider it compatible enough to, to work around it? To need, yeah, to need it. Uh, well, just like with water, it's considered an energy source if it's coming into a system or, or it's going out of a system. So even when it's uh, lower pressure, it might be lower hazard than a high pressure steam. But it's still, are you, are you talking about the double block and bleed or whether or not this has to be locked out? Is there any threshold where the requirements uh, are more stringent uh, between different pressure uh, steam? Line? When you're working around steam, you treat it all the same, double block and bleed, even if it's low pressure, just because it can build up. The valves are more prone to leaking on steam valves, and that's the best way to protect yourself. Air valves, water valves themselves can be trusted, which is a single lock point. But steam valves are notorious for leaking, so you want to approach it with that method. And lastly, wear proper PPE just in case everything else fails. Steam, because it can be so hot, you want to make sure you have some protection there. So water, why is water hazardous? Maybe it might be more than a glass of water, but why is water hazardous? What's that? A mix of water? No, I'm saying it could be a base, so some could go in there and, and join with the water. Right. right, yeah, it could be something that activates it, yep. Burn you? Water could be hot, could have chemicals in, in with it. Water itself is a hazard as well, even if it was just pure H2O. In addition to causing uh, potential injury to the person working on it, if it's high pressure, it also could cause damage to the property that causes injuries as well. If it's leaking around electrical components, flooding the property, so OSHA's regulation was written to protect you, but that also meshes with protecting the property and equipment because if the equipment's failing because of short circuiting and there's fires because of the flooding, then you're in danger now. So water can be a hazard, not just because of the hazards it introduces, like <coughs> electricity and air and things, other, other energy. It also introduces hazards of flooding if you're in a confined space, flooding the area for other electrical components. 
and often water is mixed with other chemicals. Pressurized water can cause mechanical movement. There's some systems that are hydraulic systems using water instead of hydraulic fluid because when it leaks, there's no, no hazard to it. In that case, water would be the, uh, the driving force there. I was working at a power generation <coughs> facility, and they, they told me too, this was something I learned, when water is introduced to the hot ash, it can create an explosive condition. Explosive from just water going into ash because the ash can be so hot the outer layer acts as an insulator and it cools down to maybe 500 degrees and the inside layer could be several thousand degrees. And when the water is dropped on it, it instantly turns into a steam cloud with a 500 to 1 expansion ratio. So it'll engulf, it'll suck the oxygen out of the room, engulf people around it. So <laughs> it seems like dumping water on ash wouldn't be a hazard there. But in that case, water in their industry is an extreme hazard. They have to be very careful if they're working above an ash cloud or if they're working above an ash pit or something. They don't want to have that water leaking down into that. Something you probably didn't think about, right? Maybe for sex with, yeah. The other thing, too, is in the steel industry, if you pour water on bulk of steel. Mm -hmm. Explosive because yeah. it's instant flash. Yep. And they do that to treat it, too, right, at some points in the process? Yeah. So it has to be part of the hazards. Here's a case study on water damage. I'm going to breeze through this. Uh, when I had mentioned property damage, the pump wasn't locked out, caused a flood. 55,000 in damage because they didn't lock it out. Nobody's injured, but because they didn't put a, lo a valve lock on there and prevent that, that uh, valve from being opened back up while it was being serviced, there was a, a large amount of damage to the property. Uh, obviously, another example what not to do. This person is working with an electric power drill over a pool in an aluminum ladder and he's wet up to his chest. <laughs> And he's, yeah, it looks, he's barefooted. Thanks for catching that one. A few things wrong in that picture. So with water, lock out water at the valves. Drain off any remaining water if applicable. Verify either visually or with the pressure gauge. So any other lockable energies that we're, we're looking at in your, in your industry? Chemicals, one, we talked about a little bit with the fuels, but there's a lot more chemicals. Even hazardous waste is an energy that's beyond water because it has a certain uh, characteristic that requires PPE to be worn when you're servicing around it. So identifying what those substances are that are coming into <coughs> it. And I know there's a lot of lot different chemicals in your facility that if you're not careful when you're working around it, can cause burns just from the, the nature of the chemical, not the temperature. Making sure you identify these things in your lockout procedures, not just as valve or water, but actually what is that substance. If it's contaminated substance, if it's acid, you actually verified that and you, you registered it as such. <coughs>